Growing up in an upscale neighborhood of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, the only girl out of three children, Akita Harden has a bright future ahead of her. She was raised in the church. She sang in the choir. She was a cheerleader. She was a kind-hearted soul. She really was. But childhood is far from perfect. With an absent father, her mom must rely on extended family to help out. I worked long hours, and my dad, my auntie, and them kind of raised my kids, but I made sure that they really didn't want for anything. I think I kind of spoiled her because she was my only daughter. When a child is brought up and given everything that they want, they become overly dependent on others to reinforce them when it comes to gratification. They get it now, and they want it now. As a teenager, Akita's hormones kick into high gear. She starts looking for love and a man who will fulfill her heart's desires. Instead, she finds herself a young single mother. She had her first baby at 17. After she graduated from high school, she was trying to find herself. I believe she may have reference to having a job here and there, but, but no legitimate work history to, to speak of. By her mid-twenties, she's the mother of four more children. They were from different fathers. She essentially seemed to bounce around from guy to guy. Gita never talked about the fathers. She never talked about why those relationships didn't work. She lives with her mom and does her best to make ends meet by working at a nearby hotel. And just like her mother did when she was young, Akita leans heavily on family. That her mother would take care of some of her children to some extent. But the everyday grind is wearing thin for the young mom, and she dreams of a better future. She wanted a nice life for herself. She wanted the cars and the jewelry and making sure that she herself is provided for. She wanted to have things to, to impress people. That's what she was striving to achieve. With someone like Akita, who was just so caught up with having a certain lifestyle, wanting these very special things, these expensive things, she became obsessed with getting them by any means necessary. Knowing she'll never make big money toiling away at minimum wage jobs, Akita starts to take shortcuts to get some quick cash. But the law eventually catches up to her when she commits identity theft and access device fraud. Which is basically you take a car, you drive a car that you didn't have permission to do so. She gets a minimum of four months jail time and a year probation. Her bad decisions take a toll on her family. I guess she might, might have just, I don't know, didn't want to work. I don't, I don't know. The single mom's life is spiraling out of control. One night, she gets dolled up and heads out with a girlfriend to a club in the neighboring city of Lebanon. The women catch the eye of quite a few of the men, but 40-year-old Eddie Williams doesn't waste any time. He makes his move. That he was physically imposing. He was a large man. He was a, 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 a muscular man. He was someone who was street smart. He had a certain swagger to him. And his wingman, 29-year-old Chris Willis, is right behind him. Chris did not come across as scary at all. Chris, quite frankly, was quite the opposite. He just looked like a regular guy. They tell the ladies that they just moved into town from New York, looking to expand their business. And when Akita asks what it is that they do, Eddie smiles and admits that what they sell isn't exactly legal. I sell little pharmaceuticals. Eddie Williams is a drug dealer. He is a street guy. Chris was also a drug dealer. They moved to Lebanon and started moving products down here. And by product, we mean crack cocaine. I think Akita actually liked that Eddie was a thug, that Eddie was a tough guy, that Eddie was a drug dealer. And he was a smooth talker when it came to women as well. After that night, it doesn't take long for the two to give in to their passions. And soon, they are inseparable. When I initially met him, I um, thought he might be all right. I guess that's when everything was good, or they just trying to work through their relationship, trying to get to know each other. Eddie dotes on Akita, paying for everything when they're together. And she's thrilled to finally have a man in her life who can take care of her. I definitely think she looked at Eddie as a provider, someone that could give her the life that she expected or the life that she wanted. He loved her. He would tell her that frequently, and she would say the same to him. 
Akita fell head over heels for Eddie, primarily because Eddie was older, he had more money than she had ever seen, and he knew how to take care of her. Soon, Eddie asks her if she wants in on his drug selling business with Chris, so she can make some money of her own for her and her kids. Akita doesn't think twice. She readily accepts. She wanted to be involved in it, but I think she was also kind of naive to what happens to people who are involved in the drug trade. I, I really believe that she was attracted to the lifestyle, and, and I mean, it, it was a very dangerous lifestyle. I almost felt it in my bones, something bad was gonna happen. For the next few months, Chris, Eddie, and Akita quickly make names for themselves around Lebanon, selling crack cocaine. They would sometimes sell to individual users. They would sometimes sell a little bit of, of bulk to people who also wanted to sell for themselves. She would often drive Eddie from Harrisburg to Lebanon to deliver money and pick up drugs. When the drugs run out, Eddie and Chris put in the same amount of money to buy more from Chris's connection. And the process starts all over again. Chris had the connection to the drugs. The connection was in New York, and the connection was related to Chris. The trio get along, and business is booming. Akita finally has the lifestyle she's been craving. Everything is good. They're dealing product. They're making money. And when Chris moves into a nicer apartment in South Lebanon, he offers his old place to his partners. He struck a deal with Akita and Eddie, where they moved in. They took over his lease. Even though Akita will have to leave her children in Harrisburg with her mother, things are finally looking up. But that's all about to change. By the beginning of the new year, Eddie and Akita start to notice that the amount of drugs Chris is giving them to sell is dwindling. So he was still giving Chris the same amount of money, but he was getting a smaller quantity of product to then sell. And they also see that Chris seems to be living exceedingly well. Whenever he's around, he's blinged out with a new piece of jewelry or clothing. He had this really nice, flashy lifestyle. Eddie was getting very fed up. Uh, Eddie was frustrated. Both Akita and Eddie felt personally disrespected. On the flip side, they're just scraping by and can no longer afford the lifestyle that Akita wants. They weren't paying the rent. They weren't paying their utility bills. It's really a mystery what they did with their money. And eventually the landlord uh, threw Eddie and Akita out of the apartment. They came to Harrisburg. He was staying with his cousin and Akita was staying with me. To make matters worse, Akita has some shocking news for Eddie. I'm pregnant. You pregnant? Eddie doesn't take the news well. He goes into panic mode. That added some stress to their relationship. Eddie wasn't happy about the baby. Obviously, she had a multitude of other children. Akita wanted to keep that baby, primarily because she loved Eddie, and she was also used to the lifestyle, and so she saw the baby as being an anchor in achieving that goal. She tells Eddie there must be something they can do to make more money. And Akita said to Eddie, essentially, you need to deal with this because we're getting ripped off by Chris. He's living this great lifestyle. We've got nothing. You need to fix it. He tells his girl not to worry. He'll take care of everything. So one day, a few weeks later, Eddie gives his boy a call to find out what's going on. And things get heated fast. Eddie lays down the law while Akita watches. The argument could have been over the apartment money. It could have been over drug money. But the relationship deteriorated exponentially. And during the conversation, Chris says they're out of the drug game. He's cutting them off. Eddie and Akita are both livid. So all of that melded together to create the anger, the unrest, the frustration. But the fuming couple aren't going to go away quietly. Eddie knows exactly what needs to be done, but he's going to need his girl's help. He told her, I'm going to take it all from Chris. His plan is to just take what he feels he's owed. And there is no shortage of loot at Chris's place. They knew that the jewelry that he had, the cars that he had, the drugs that would be in the apartment, the money, all of it. But Eddie needs help. And he has the perfect man for the job. His cousin, 34-year-old Rick Cannon. Rick lived in Harrisburg. Rick was, however, known as a stick-up guy. He robbed drug dealers. And even though she knows things could turn violent, 
Akita insists on joining them. I think she was becoming accustomed to being around these thugs because these are not your average drug dealers. They were gangsters. And I never knew that it was that bad. Akita felt just as cheated as Eddie. She wanted revenge. And add on to that, she had found someone who she really loved in Eddie. And this was a way to hold on to him and hold on to that lifestyle that she came to love. The next morning, around 9 a.m., Akita borrows a car from a friend and heads to Rick's place to pick up her boyfriend and his cousin. And both men are strapped. Eddie and Rick come out of the apartment. Rick had a shotgun. Eddie had a Makarov 9mm. With Akita behind the wheel, she drives them over to Chris's apartment. While she and Rick wait in the car, Eddie approaches the home. He knocked on the door. Chris answered the door, let Eddie in. Eddie then went up into the apartment. But when he gets inside, he sees Chris is not alone. By his side is 24-year-old Marcus Ortiz. Marcus was a bigger guy. I mean, he was taller, he was broader, much like Eddie. Now there's this new variable. They never met him before. But Eddie's too far gone now to turn back. Plus, there's cocaine and stacks of cash ripe for the taking. He hits up Rick on the cell and calls him in for backup. Well, he actually brought in Rick, and then Akita had asked if she could come in to use the restroom. I would assume it was, it was quite stressful for them, knowing that the plan wasn't working the way they wanted it to work, and, and they had to sort of reroute what they were doing. They all make small talk. There was nothing to indicate that there was any type of arguments or bad blood that morning. Then Akita gets a phone call and casually heads back to the car. She went outside and, and sat in the car and, and spoke on the phone with her friend while Rick and Eddie remained in the apartment. Akita must have known what was going to happen, but she was just so wrapped up in this lifestyle and the love that she had with Eddie that she really wasn't acknowledging the explosive potential of this particular action. A few minutes later, Eddie and Rick say they have to go too. Chris walks them out while Marcus hangs in the kitchen. They make their way to the front door, when suddenly, without saying a word, Eddie twists around and opens fire. While Rick keeps Marcus busy, Chris, shot in the arm, hides in a closet. Then the door swings open to reveal his former best friend. Eddie grabbed him from the closet and, and pulled him out on the floor. Chris knows exactly what's about to happen to him. As Eddie puts that gun against his head, he knows what's going to happen to him. That's when Eddie fires. While Chris lays bleeding to death, he sees Eddie steal his watch and ring off of his finger. There is no more of a terrifying experience for a human being to go through than what he went through when he was shot. Then Eddie turns his attention to Marcus Ortiz. The gun was taken, put to the head of Marcus, and Marcus was shot and killed. I never would imagine anybody would have been killed, no, never. He was just violent. While Rick runs out, Eddie gathers up the drugs and about $8,000 in cash from the table and puts it in a brown paper bag. Kita heard gunshots coming from the apartment, and she jumped into the front seat of the car and started the car up. Neighbors also hear the shots and call 911. And as luck would have it, there's a patrol car already at the complex just happened to be there. So his response time was seconds. The officer sees Rick and Eddie run out and jump in the SUV. Once they're in the car, Akita slams her foot on the gas. Akita rips out of there and starts driving at a very high pace. The officer hustles back to his car and it starts chasing them. As soon as she hears the sirens, Akita panics. She's in oncoming lanes of traffic up hills. She's going well over 100 miles an hour. And Akita tries to turn around and knocks over a street sign and makes it in somebody's front yard. Her driving really was miraculous for how well she handled that vehicle. It was an amazing chase. Suddenly, Akita slows down just enough for Rick to throw out his shotgun. But after just over 11 minutes, they realize they need to make a run for it. She stops the car. Rick Cannon gets out and runs left. Eddie Williams gets out and runs right. Kita continues to drive forward. Rick Cannon is chased by this officer who had been pursuing them all along, and he's caught a few blocks um, down the road. He just voluntarily stops running. As his cousin Rick is taken into custody, Eddie Williams takes off. Eddie took off between two houses. 
and that was the last he was seen at that point in time. He got away. Couldn't find him. But the dangerous dealer leaves a wealth of evidence in his wake. Right outside of the spot where we know Eddie jumped out, we found Chris's ring with Chris's blood on the ring. He threw the murder weapon, the gun, and we also found a bag of crack cocaine. Meanwhile, Akita pulls the SUV into an alleyway and takes off on foot. Eventually, an officer driving down the street uh, saw Akita standing on the corner wearing clothing that matched the description of, of what we knew the driver was wearing. She's arrested and hauled in for questioning. And despite facing an abundance of evidence, Akita is tight-lipped. Akita tried to say she didn't really know Eddie. She had nothing to do with this. She didn't know where he'd be, where he was. Even when she finds out that the shots Eddie fired put Chris on life support and killed Marcus Ortiz, she refuses to turn on her man. But Eddie's cousin, Rick Cannon, is not so loyal. He's quick to cut a deal. He pleads guilty to multiple offenses, including third-degree murder. Rick was sentenced to a minimum of 50 years with a maximum of 100 years in jail. For almost seven months, Eddie is still at large, and Akita continues to claim her innocence and keep her mouth shut when it comes to her boyfriend. I don't know why she felt like she had to stick with this man. I couldn't believe that he had that much control over her, but he did. While Akita is awaiting trial on 21 charges, including attempted murder and first-degree murder, Eddie is finally picked up in Philadelphia. He's hauled back to Lebanon to face similar charges and says he's innocent. Almost a year after the shooting, Akita Hardin and Eddie Williams are tried together. They both testify on their own behalf. Eddie laid the blame entirely upon Rick Cannon, said Rick was the shooter, that there was no plan to commit any robbery. There was no plan to kill them. Akita maintains her innocence, saying she was just in the car. Her defense was that she did not know they were going to rob them. She wasn't part of it. The jury doesn't believe either one of them. Eddie is found guilty of multiple charges, including attempted murder and first-degree murder. Akita Hardin is also found guilty of multiple charges, including attempted murder and second-degree murder. Eddie received a life sentence. He'll spend the rest of his life in jail with no possibility for parole. Akita got the exact same sentence. She was very emotional. She didn't say much, but she was very emotional. She apologizes to her family during her sentencing, but never mentions the victims or their family. When you love somebody or you think you're in love with somebody, you, be, you do stupid stuff. I hope that people would have like a forgiving heart towards her because it was just a bad choice all the way around that she made and she regrets it. I don't believe that Akita would have been involved had she not been involved with Eddie. And she risked everything to go along with this plan. I think that part of it was certainly she was in love with Eddie. Secondly, and he gave her a lifestyle of riches that she always desired and her desire to have it all caused her to lose it all. Alicia Warrior's plot to start fresh with a new man backfired, leaving her husband dead and her life in ruins. Story, Alicia Southern's life starts off carefree and joyful. Her family describes her as being a very loving, happy child. But that all changes when, at a young age, she endures a horrific encounter. She was raped by someone very close to her family. Alicia kept this a secret. She didn't tell anyone. It had turned her from an easygoing child to someone who was very angry inside. And she began to not be able to trust people. When we look at uh, victims of sexual abuse, especially when they're young, it leaves all sorts of not just physical scars, but emotional, psychological scars, uh, especially if they're not able to get the psychotherapy to help them work through a lot of that trauma. The nightmare finally ends when, in her early teens, her family moves from Missouri to Kansas City, Kansas, and the troubled young girl is able to make a fresh start. 
that was kind of her escape from, you know, what had happened. And after a while, she was able to make new friends and meet new people and become a new person. Throughout high school, Alicia grows as a woman and manages to put her dark past behind her. She became happy. She became outgoing. She made new friends. She excelled in all of her grades, all of her classes. And after graduation, she starts community college and even meets a man. But after only dating for a short time, she jumps into a hasty commitment. Well, the wedding plans are all in place. At a very young age, she was married and then divorced. What we tend to see with victims of sexual abuse, especially when they're young, is that they are so emotionally traumatized, leaving them at risk at being in very dysfunctional relationships, especially with people who look to take advantage of uh, or to manipulate them. After her marriage ends, Alicia dusts herself off and moves forward. Alicia was 25 years old, she was divorced, but things were looking up for her. She started a new job in a clerical position and she started community college. Though she may not have been looking for love at the time, while she's at work, Alicia meets a strapping 23-year-old named Jeremy Warrior. Awesome. Jeremy was a real nice guy, he had a big smile, he laughed when you talked to him like you were telling a joke sometimes. <laughs> And he was just a good kid. But Jeremy isn't your average 9 to 5 employee. He's on a work release program from a local prison. The work release program is for criminals that don't have a violent record. They let him go out and work. He tells her that he was married. But when he tried to break up with his wife, things got ugly. I hear this banging at my door. I go to answer the door, and it's her. She came over with the gun just to try to scare Jeremy, and he tried to take it from her. And when he did, it went off and shot her in the foot. And that's why he got sent in. Sympathetic to Jeremy's situation, the two bond over their relationship dramas. So not only was Alicia very happy with his honesty, they both were going through huge breakups. So they could be two divorced people together. Most people shy away from a person who's been in jail, but in many ways, Alicia was open to Jeremy and was willing to accept that he wasn't the perfect person and that he had a prison record. There was something exciting, titillating about that. Every day, Jeremy and Alicia would see each other in the office. They would strike up conversation. And before long, conversations in the office turned into more than just friends. A few months into their knowing each other, Alicia is thrilled when Jeremy finally earns parole. It's not long before they officially become a couple. Now, she can be with him physically and outside of work. Within a month after he got his apartment, that's when I went over and I met Alicia. He told me, this is going to be my future wife. <laughs> he gets a little funny laugh. A man of his word. Within just a year of dating, the two marry. The wedding was great. I mean, the whole family was there, and Jeremy really loved the girl. Alicia loved Jeremy, and it seemed like they were going to live happily ever after. The newlyweds move out to the Kansas City suburbs to start their life together, and Jeremy finds a job nearby, driving trucks for a concrete company. With what Alicia had been through in her life, now she has a man who is the answer to her prayers. He's a hard worker, he loves her. That's everything she could have ever wanted. But just two years into the marriage, Alicia grows tired of the suburban life. She struggles to find permanent employment. And with Jeremy at his job all day and no friends in the area, she's left alone with no one to see and nothing to do. When Alicia first met Jeremy, she liked the thrill of him having this bad boy vibe. But now, you know, he had a job and he worked all day and he was just a normal guy and it was driving her crazy. But her boring life is about to get all too exciting. When she lands a job, she still craves excitement in her life and finds what she's looking for in 35-year-old Darrell Rogers. Darrell was a friend of a coworker of Alicia's and they met just out one night at a gathering. While Alicia is irritated by her humdrum husband, she's intrigued by the older man's swagger. Darrell is somebody I would describe as a, as a hustler. 
You know, he was always out looking to make some money. He was on federal probation for a firearms charge at the time. Darrell was everything Alicia ever wanted. He had a lot of swag. He was also an ex-con. And she needed that throwback, and he was exactly it. At first, Alicia and Darrell sneak around while Jeremy is working. But they can't seem to get enough of each other. So every evening after work, Alicia ducks out and goes to Darrell's house to spend more time with her new beau. She wasn't telling Jeremy where she was or what she was doing, and that was causing some conflict. Over the next several weeks, Jeremy gets more and more suspicious. He confides in close family that he suspects she might be having an affair, and he is fed up. Go have a guy's night. He said, Alicia's been going and staying out all night and not coming home. He says, I kind of let it go for a while, but I think I'm about ready to get a divorce. But he's not the only one who is tired of the marriage. Every argument they have just pushes her closer to her secret lover. Zarella and Alicia fell in love almost instantly. And she did want to leave Jeremy, but she knew if she left, she wouldn't get the house. She wouldn't have any money. And Darrell, he didn't have a job. He couldn't take care of her. She was ready to move on from Jeremy, and she wanted him out of the way. Just when Alicia begins to give up hope of ever being able to start over with her new man, the solution to all their problems comes from an unexpected source, her job. Alicia was working at an insurance company, and I know Jeremy was interested in getting insurance because he wanted his family taken care of. Alicia learns that both she and her husband are eligible to take out sizable policies. The insurance was in case anything physically happened to Jeremy, either on the job or if he did die, Alicia would get $400,000. Alicia tells Darrell about her discovery and jokingly says that if they just get rid of Jeremy, they'd have tons of cash. But Darrell isn't laughing. He thinks it's the perfect plan. Darrell didn't take it as a joke. He wanted the money, he wanted Jeremy gone. The couple starts scheming. Step one, get Jeremy to sign the life insurance policy, a task that turns out to be a snap. Most people have life insurance for their spouse, their children, so I'm sure Jeremy did it with ease, thinking nothing of it. Do I get gifts for that? Yeah. I think. I do. Yeah. All right. Guess who has some good news? Why are you happy? With the policy in place, they plot out the murder. They decide to stage an elaborate carjacking and shoot Jeremy in the process. And Alicia offers up one additional idea. So to make this story look believable, Alicia decided, hey, shoot me too, but only shoot me in the leg. Nothing life-threatening, just something that it will seem like I can't be in on this. This is really happening. The more she got involved with Darrell, the deeper they fell in love. The more she drifted to the dark side and the idea of her husband disappearing was now starting to become much more tangible. The conniving couple realize they'll need help to pull this off. And Darrell assures Alicia he knows the perfect guy, Jamar Moore. Jamar is another kind of a street person, and he ran around with Darrell as you know, kind of a sidekick. All you're doing is driving, all right? And I'm going to give you a cut of the money. How much a cut you talking about? Thanks to some smooth talking and the promise of a few thousand dollars, Jamar's on board to act as the getaway driver for what he thinks is a simple carjacking. Darrell decided that the less information that Jamar knew, the better. So he told him that they were just going to rob Jeremy. Nobody's going to get hurt. Nobody's going to get killed. With the final puzzle piece in place, the toxic couple agrees to carry out the deed three weeks later. The evening before the attack, Alicia cozies up to her husband and tells him there's a change of plan for their morning commute. She told Jeremy she was going to take him to work that morning because she needed to take the car to the mechanics to get the car fixed. Jeremy had his guard down, so he didn't really find any issues with that. The next morning, around 5.30 a.m., Alicia and Jeremy head out of their driveway. And just a short distance away, Darrell and Jamar lie in wait in a rented SUV. They park the vehicle up the street, and Alicia's lights going off were going to be a signal that the plan is continuing forward. As Alicia gets to the top of a hill in their neighborhood, she spots their vehicle and slows down to signal them. 
Then she lowers the passenger side window where Jeremy sits. Hey, what are you doing? When that happened, Darrell got out of the car, ran up to the passenger seat, and fired into the vehicle. To make it look like a random carjacking, Darrell also fires one shot at the woman he loves. Jamar started to drive the vehicle away, and Darrell runs up, jumps in the passenger seat, and they leave. A neighbor who hears the shots fired calls 911. Go, go, go. And when officers arrive on the scene, they come upon a bullet-ridden vehicle and two blood-soaked passengers. Alicia is non-responsive in the driver's seat. Jeremy's deceased in the passenger seat. They take Alicia out of the car, rush her to the hospital, and then they start to process the crime scene. We woke up, and you know, the news was on. I seen yellow tape, police cars, and they said it was a murder. And I just knew it was Jerry. At the hospital, Alicia finally wakes up. She is disoriented, but she recalls seeing Jeremy die in front of her eyes before blacking out. She is pleased that their plan has gone off without a hitch. That is until she tries to adjust her position in her bed and realizes she's unable to move her legs. The single shot that Darrell fired at Alicia hit her in the spine. She was shot in a different manner than they had planned, which caused the significant injury and resulted in her being paralyzed. There must have been a range of emotions that Alicia was feeling. Her husband was gone, and now she can have this idyllic relationship with Darrell. But for her now to end up in a wheelchair, how could something like this have happened? It was so well planned. And for Alicia, things just go from bad to worse. When detectives arrive to speak with the new widow, they ask her if she knows a man by the name of Darrell Rogers. Darrell had actually called Alicia that morning, and we knew that based on his phone records. Okay, we'll check the records. She realized that they knew more than perhaps they were telling her. She was like a cornered animal, and all she could do was to just save her own skin. Alicia breaks down and admits to having an affair with Darrell, but that's not all. She takes this opportunity to turn on her lover without implicating herself. She said he was super jealous, super controlling. He wanted her to himself, and that he was determined to get rid of Jeremy. So he was the one that shot him. He's the one who did this. Darrell is arrested in connection with the attack on Jeremy and Alicia. With Darrell behind bars, a now wheelchair-bound Alicia is set to be the star witness in his trial. But then, a week before the preliminary hearing, Prosecutors receive a stunning phone call that their ace witness has had a change of heart. Alicia recanted her identification of Darrell. She said that she only identified Darrell because the police forced her to say it. Without Alicia's testimony, police have nothing. They have to cut Darrell loose. We didn't have really any other alternative but to dismiss the case because we had no other evidence at the time against him. Now a free man. Darrell moves in with Alicia, and the couple starts their life together. He takes care of his now paralyzed love, and they relish in their achievement. As a result of Jeremy's death, the insurance companies paid out a little over $400,000, and immediately she started spending money. Alicia was quite brilliant in all of this. She knew she was never going to testify against Darrell, and she knew without her testimony, there would be no case. She played the police, she played the system, and now she had her man and her money. For three years, they look to be in the clear. That is, until the dogged investigators come across another name, Jamar Moore, a known associate of Durrell. So the police decided to bring Jamar in for questioning, and it wasn't too hard to get answers out of him. They never did pay him anything. He was upset that he was not getting any type of a share. The spurned getaway driver spares no detail. Jamar said that Alicia came up with the idea, and Durrell took care of the plan. So it connected all the dots that our theory was correct. In exchange for his testimony, he receives only three years behind bars. And with the strong case building against him, Durrell decides to get ahead of the situation. Durrell approached us and said that he would cooperate. And in exchange for a truthful statement, we had agreed to a 20-year sentence. Alicia, on the other hand, maintains her innocence and takes her chances in court. It's a gamble that she loses. The judge said, we're sentencing Alicia Warrior to a hard 50. She'll never get out. 
I feel like Alicia was looking for a way out of her marriage with Jeremy. And Darrell just happened to be there. He wasn't really significant. He could have been anyone else that showed her some attention. You have this woman that's having this affair with the person that kills her husband. And she got some money out of it. But in the end, you know, she ends up in prison and paralyzed from the waist down. Alicia was a young woman who had been through a lot. In many ways, it set the groundwork for her to make catastrophic choices, and her discontent ended up being her complete and total undoing.